Chemical warfare is not new, but evolving. The ancient Greeks used fire to reduce forts in the 5th century BC. Modern chemical warfare began in World War I, which everyone expected to be a short, heroic war. Contrary to the enthusiasm reflected in this British recruiting poster, the war quickly degenerated into a stalemate in the trenches on the Western Front. There were several types of efforts to break this stalemate, including the tank, aircraft, and toxic chemicals. On 22 April 1915 at Ypres, Belgium, the Germans used 1,000 modified commercial chlorine cylinders to create a gas cloud that routed opposing French troops. Although most sources estimate the number of casualties to have been about 5,000, many troops stayed in place and continued to fight protected by such simple expedients as wetting their handkerchiefs and placing them over their mouth and nose. Both sides quickly developed simple but effective protective measures, such as this French mask of treated cheesecloth and this German horse mask. Gas clouds were comparatively ineffective and difficult to use, especially for the Germans, who had the disadvantage of prevailing winds blowing toward them. They had to postpone the first attack at Ypres a week to await favorable winds. So, both sides soon developed projected munitions. This British Livens projector shot a three-gallon container. Hundreds could be fired simultaneously to produce a dense gas cloud on target, achieving surprise and sometimes overwhelming the filters of the protective devices. The U.S. watched toxic warfare for almost two years without taking any steps to prepare for warfare in such an environment. Most people still thought of war in terms of infantry with bayonets. Finally, on 3 April 1917, just before President Wilson declared war, the National Research Council accepted a proposal to establish an experimental station at the American University in Washington, D.C. This building was the first facility of the Chemical Warfare Service from which the modern chemical core descended. To support the war effort, a committee was formed from the Medical, Ordnance, Signal Corps, and the Bureau of Mines. In June 1917, General John J. Pershing, the commander of the American Expeditionary Force in France, created an independent gas service within the AEF to centralize preparations for American troops to fight in the toxic environment. Pershing appointed Lieutenant Colonel Amos Fries to head this temporary organization. In September, when this organization was officially established as the 30th Engineers, the Gas and Flame Regiment, Fries was promoted to Colonel. He later rose to Major General and was a Chief of the CWS from 1920 to 1929. On 28 June 1918, the War Department responded to Pershing's recommendation to create an organization similar to the gas service in the AEF. This new organization was the Chemical Warfare Service. Its first chief was Major General William L. Siebert, one of the builders of the Panama Canal. The Chemical Corps celebrates 28 June as the anniversary of its birth. With this establishment, the 30th Engineers became the 1st Gas Regiment, and Colonel Fries was promoted to Brigadier General. A large percentage of this regiment had college degrees, when few Americans even finished high school. The distinctive insignia of the Chemical Warfare Service was the crossed retorts under a benzene ring. The retorts symbolized chemistry. Benzene was a common component in many of the toxic chemical compounds that the CWS arose to handle. Chemical warfare had effects that ranged far beyond the battlefield. To meet the logistical demands of the CWS, a new arsenal was built at Edgewood, Maryland to produce chemical munitions. In 1920, when the Chemical Warfare Service was established as a permanent part of the Army, Edgewood became the site of the first permanent chemical school. 
Producing enough protective equipment for American troops posed a huge problem. Because they were available, and also because they had superior dexterity for precision work, women came into the workforce making masks on a huge scale. A major problem was producing filters. Charcoal made the best filters, and the best charcoal was made from coconut shells. The number of filters to be made, however, quickly exhausted the supply of coconuts. The next best filters turned out to be made from the charcoal from fruit pits, so a nationwide campaign encouraged people to save fruit pits. Successful protection led to searches for ways to defeat the mask. The most successful was mustard, a new agent the Germans first used in July 1917. Though seldom lethal, mustard posed a serious problem and remained the highest single casualty producer among the toxic agents. The large number of unknown came from the fact that many casualties were exposed to several gases at the same time. By war's end, a vast effort had gone into coping with toxic chemical warfare. A wide variety of masks had been developed. The nationwide campaign in the U.S. produced huge piles of fruit pits such as this one. Notice the man standing on the top right. After World War I, much of this effort was neglected for several reasons. Even though only about 3% of chemical casualties died, as compared to 25% for casualties from conventional munitions, publicity about chemical warfare in World War I produced great fear of gas, seen as somehow more horrible than conventional weapons. This German painting, entitled Shock Troops Advancing Through Gas, reflected this feeling. Through the 1920s and 30s, most attention to military matters focused on conventional improvements, such as motorization and disarmament through a number of treaties, including a 1925 Geneva Protocol to outlaw toxic chemical weapons. Despite popular horror of them and treaties against them, toxic agents remained a serious concern through the 1920s and 1930s. There were rumors that toxic chemicals were being used in the Russian Revolution. In the 1930s, the Japanese were believed to be using toxics against the Chinese. There were also rumors, though unsubstantiated until the end of World War II, that the Germans were developing new, deadlier toxic agents. The CWS continued to train people through its school at Edgewood, and in 1934 received permission to have a distinctive insignia. The school insignia included a dragon, symbolic of fire and destruction. The motto, Elementus Regimus Prolium, means let us rule the battle by means of the elements. The school also received permission to have a device which included the elements of the insignia and added a lamp to represent the light of knowledge. The shield included the CWS colors gold and blue. Expecting its use in World War II, all nations prepared for toxic warfare especially conducted by aerial bombardment against civilians. As a result, British schoolchildren carried gas masks during the Battle of Britain. Protecting civilians especially created a problem. Many children were too frightened to don the masks, so Walt Disney worked with the CWS. He designed this Mickey Mouse mask with the idea that all children were so familiar with the friendly cartoon figure that they would not be afraid of anything connected with him. As the U.S. prepared for combat in World War II, troops received intensive training on toxic hazards through a variety of methods. Decontamination schools were set up in the United States, Australia, and the British Isles. Posters were to teach how to recognize specific agents by association with common smells. Phosgene was described as smelling like green corn. Some of the training, such as the warning to take care of your mask, would still apply today. Even pinup calendars were used to convey the message. There really was a protective cover like this for defense against aerial sprays. Toxics, however, were not used by or against the U.S. German troops were not armed with chemical weapons. Germany concentrated on achieving fast, mobile warfare using aircraft, especially the dive bomber, to support infantry with automatic weapons. The only toxic casualties in Europe occurred accidentally in 1943. The U.S. secretly moved some toxic chemicals to Italy to have on hand should Germany decide to begin using toxics. 
An American ship carrying mustard agent was bombed at Bari, Italy. Smoke and contaminated water produced a substantial number of casualties before any of the survivors discovered the hazard. Though not engaged in toxic warfare, troops of the Chemical Warfare Service made many important contributions. The portable flamethrower was used especially in the Pacific. Chemical mortar battalions using the 4.2-inch mortar were highly prized as support to infantry in both the Pacific and Europe, and later in Korea. Troops of the CWS, having vehicles, were part of the famous Red Ball Express and kept supplies moving to the Allied forces sweeping across Europe after D-Day. Large area smoke was used to protect harbors and airfields. These uses would later reappear in Korea. Tactical smoke became part of the standard operating procedures in river crossings in Europe. The CWS also led toward the post-war integration of the armed forces. The CWS took more than its proportionate share of black troops and refused requests to assign only white units to support white organizations. Truck-mounted decontamination equipment doubled for portable laundries, showers, and firefighting. The discovery of nerve agents in April 1945 created a new concern at the end of World War II for improved detection capabilities and new improved protective clothing. There was also a new emphasis, biological defense, a mission the CWS had been given during World War II. In 1946, the CWS was redesignated as the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. In 1951, the chemical school moved to Fort McClellan and in 1954 occupied Seabird Hall, built specifically as a home for the chemical corps. The school also received a distinctive shoulder patch, including the crossed retorts and a torch, which represented the light of knowledge and which became a common element in all service school patches. In Vietnam, there was widespread use of defoliants such as the well-known Agent Orange and smoke for marking artillery targets. Portable riot control agent dispersers were used to flush tunnels Flame, such as napalm, was also used extensively in the early phases. Generally, however, Vietnam remained a conventional war, often of infantrymen wading through muddy water. In 1973, the U.S. wanted a diplomatic gesture to show good faith in wanting to rid the world of the threat of toxic chemical and biological warfare. As a part of this gesture, the Chemical Corps ceased to commission officers. The school was disestablished and absorbed into the Ordnance School at Aberdeen Proving Ground near Edgewood, Maryland. Evidence during the mid-1970s showed the Soviets and their allies were not following the lead toward ending the chemical threat. Rumors of toxic agents being used by third world countries, such as by Iraq against Iran, also proved to be true. Mustard casualties showed that the threat had become even more widespread than was true before 1973. So, in 1979, the school reopened at Aberdeen. In December, it moved to Fort McClellan and occupied former Women's Army Corps facilities. Today, the chemical school is rebuilding, trying to recover lost ground and seeking better ways to accomplish its mission. As a part of this improvement, the school is completing the chemical decontamination training facility where students can practice with real toxic agents in a realistic setting. Plans have already been approved for a major expansion to Faith Hall, the main classroom building. A part of this rebuilding includes major work on the Chemical Corps Museum, which was reopened in 1982 with a memorial park.